1961, the U.S. space program, which was created to start man's advancement into space, was attempting to launch the first human into space, Alan Shepard. It was a competition with the Russians. The press drove that immensely. There was a great deal of turmoil in the space program, but even more in the U.S. A gentleman named Yuri Gagarin flew in space. And not only did he not do a suborbital flight, he did an orbital flight. So while the Russians indeed scored a coup, the doctors quickly decided that it was okay for us to put Alan Shepard in space in a suborbital flight. I think I ran the whole gamut of emotions, really. Getting into the suit, going through the physical and so on, that was all rote, that we'd practiced that so much. The excitement really didn't start to build until the trailer pulled up at the launch pad. I walked out and looked at that huge redstone rocket for the first time. And I thought, well, now, there is that little rascal, and, uh, and I'm going to get up on top and fly that thing. And, you know, pilots always go out to the airplanes and kick the tires before they fly. Nobody would let me get near the rocket to kick the fins, but I kind of walked around and thought, well, I'll take a good look at it because I'll never see that part of the machine again. And I uh, thought, well, okay, Buster, let's go and get the job done. A lot of times people have said, oh, you really must have been scared. Fortunately, I wasn't scared. Nervous, but not frightened to death. There has to be a belief, a dedication to training to the point where you just absolutely not panic. All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. But at that point, you're basically thinking, what do I do if this goes wrong? What do I do if that goes wrong? In some cases, the fact that you're accelerating with the thrust of the rocket, that's good because, you know, the rocket is doing its job and it's doing it correctly. This is Freedom 7. The fuel is go 4G. 5.5 Kevin. Oxygen go. All systems are go. Just reaching the apex of the trajectory, I was going to be in the middle of the weightlessness. I'm a periscope. What a beautiful view. I said, well, now i got to get ready for re-entry, so enough of that subjective thinking. All I had to do was survive the re-entry forces. The Earth Carry spacecraft is beginning to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. 9G coming down. And you do it on a fairly, like on that flight, a rather short period of time, just 16 minutes, as a matter of fact. And the helicopter flying back to the carrier and seeing thousands of sailors, there they were cheering for me, and that was probably the first emotional moment in that whole flight. We were invited back to Washington after the mission. Jack, of course, was there. There were the heads of NASA there. We talked about the details of the flight, and he's leaning forward, listening intently to this thing. And toward the end of the conversation, she said to the NASA people, what are we doing next? They said, well, there was a couple of guys over in the corner talking about maybe going to the moon. He said, I want a briefing. Just three weeks after 15 minutes of space is when Kennedy made his announcement. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. I don't know what you think our response to that was, but frankly, it scared the hell out of me. We didn't know anything about spaceflight at that point in time. We didn't know how to do orbit determination. But suddenly, somebody was asking us to do the orbital mechanics associated with going to the moon. At that time, we were in the depths of the Cold War. The Soviets at that time were taking a lot of students to the Soviet Union, getting them their education. And then the sending them back to their countries had indoctrinated by communists, and it was getting a lot of credibility. And they were saying that they were superior to us in, in technology and in research. And to prove this, they were saying, look at their missiles and their missiles had been orbiting while ours too often had been blowing up on the launch pad. And so uh, we looked at this at that time almost as a combat mission, so you were setting out to prove that that was not so. Uh, this was our first man up launch, and at the time we uh, launched John Glenn, two of our previous five rockets had blown up. 
So when we committed to put John Glenn on top of the rocket, the odds were 40-60 uh, that this rocket might blow up. A big difference back in those days was when uh, we would make our program completely open for the rest of the world to share. The rest of the world then participated in those early flights and they liked what they saw and that's what we were doing. You got speed, John Glenn. launch back at that time was about five and a half minutes from the launch pad into orbit. What you're trying to do is get up to orbital speed, and that was about 17,500 miles per hour, which gets almost five miles a second. You're peaking up to right up to the maximum Gs just as you get into orbit, and then you're cut off, and you go from 7.7 .7 Gs to zero, and that's a, a good transition. You're really happy with that. Roger, zero G, and I feel fine. Capsule is turning around. Oh, that view is tremendous. Roger, seven, you have a go at least seven orbits. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. You go around the Earth, it takes about an hour and 29 minutes to go around the Earth, so you're doing a, a day in 45 minutes, a night in 45 minutes. Uh, Roger, Friendship 7, we say Capcom, LA, over. Roger, how you doing, Gordo? We're doing real fine up here. Everything is going very well, over. Very good, John. You sound good. Roger. That was sure a short day. Just to my right, I can see a big pattern of light. Apparently right on the coast. The lights go up very well. Thank everybody for turning them on. Near the end of the flight, two ground stations received signals from the spacecraft that the heat shield was loose. And so once the retro pack which sat in the middle of the heat shield, once it was fired and thrown away, the heat shield would be free to move around and the whole thing would probably all burn up on re-entry. We let the retro pack burn off then during re-entry. Two, one, fire. Roger. Retros are firing. Made for a very interesting re-entry from where I was because you could see these burning chunks going back by the window and uh, couldn't be absolutely certain whether they were the heat shield or the retro pack. This Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. When you see that parachute deploy, that's the prettiest thing you ever saw. Beautiful shoot! When Glenn finished his mission, Glenn Grissom and I flew with Jack back to Washington for Glenn's ceremony, and we talked about what Gus had done, we talked about what John had done, we talked about what I had done, all the way back. I tell you, he was really, really a space cadet. No man can fully grasp how far and how fast we have come. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. And it is one of the great adventures of all time. And this generation does not intend to founder in the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal is one we intend to win. We have seen facilities now being created for the greatest and most complex exploration in man's history. We have felt the ground shake and the air shattered by the testing of a Saturn. C-1 booster rocket, many times as powerful as the Atlas which launched John Glenn. After his assassination, it moved from being a challenge to literally a crusade. This was now our mission to win this battle for President Kennedy. It was visceral, it was gut. We are going to do it and we're the right people to do it, and we're going to do it in the time frame he said we'll do it. 
we recognized that we probably had to do a lot of learning. And that's when we conceived the Gemini spacecraft. It was actually a two-man version of the Mercury spacecraft. It would allow us to do rendezvous and docking in space for the first time. It would help us to find out if man could survive for 14 days at zero gravity. It would help us to do EVA. And all of these new requirements were operations that eventually we would have to do around the moon. Of course, I was delighted when I was assigned uh, command of the first Gemini flight. And it was shortly after that that I developed uh, disorientation problem in my in my ear and NASA grounded me and I was grounded for almost six years and the NASA guy said well we like you Shepard uh, you can be in charge of all the astronauts you can't fly obviously but and this was not a fault of the system but obviously being grounded was the worst thing that has ever happened to me <laughs> 